Good morning. So glad that you're here with us this morning. Great to see all of you here today. For those of you who may not have been here with us before, we want to say especially welcome. We're happy that you're here with us to worship God together and spend some time in His Word. Would you pray with me, please, as we begin? Dear Lord and Father, our God, we are here and we are listening. Please speak to us through my imperfect words this morning. More than that, please speak to us through the story of your Son. We pray that we may be touched by it because you came close enough to touch. We pray that we might be changed by it because you have a purpose and a will for our lives and we want to live it out. We pray that we might fall in love with you all over again as we hear the story of your great love given to us on a cross. We thank you most of all for that love and it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Northern France near a town called Giverny, I hope I got that right. Uh, pardon my French. Northern France, there's a, a small pond. Thankfully, it does not have a name. Might not otherwise be noteworthy, except for that it was uh, a favorite spot of one Claude Monet, the, the painter. You can see him here with the fantastic beard that he has here. It's late in his life. Uh, Monet was a, a person who was pretty well known for his paintings, particularly of water lilies. You probably are familiar with them. Near the end of his life, in fact, you could find Claude Monet by the water's edge of this small, nameless pond nearly every day, sometimes from dawn until dusk. In fact, it wasn't even until late in his life, near uh, around the 1890s, that Claude Monet first discovered his love for this one small pond in northern France. But when he did, it became his inspiration, it became his life's work to spend all the time that he could painting this small pond in every way that he could. He wanted to know the way the light glanced off of this pond at 5.30 in the morning in the winter time. He wanted to understand what it looked like when the flowers began to bloom in the spring. He wanted to be able to capture on his canvas the way that the sunset turned the pool red in the evening time in the summer. He wanted to see the way that fall began to trickle down and float along with the lilies in the pool. This was his obsession, this pond. Same small nameless pond, endless angles and, and shadows, and breezes. And even though he spent countless hours, countless years, by the, the water's edge of this same pond, if you were to ask him, he would say that he never saw the same pond twice. You know, today you can go and visit a, a museum in, in Paris. It's uh, a museum with this room in it uh, and a lot of Claude Monet's work in it. Uh, in fact, Monet himself designed this room in uh, the museum. And as you go into it and you begin to sit at these circle uh, table or benches here in the middle, all around you, you're surrounded by these eight panels of Monet's famous water lily paintings. And it's amazing what you see. Just like the, the artist, you're looking at the same pond in every painting, in every frame, in every canvas. And yet, as you see it, in, in each one, the, the waters have shifted or the seasons have changed or the light of day has drifted just a little so that each and every encounter of this same small nameless pond in northern France is unique. There's always something new and beautiful to see in it. In my life, I've had a, a similar experience with our story for this morning. And this is, of course, the central story of our faith. It's the story of the cross, 
how often we return to this story. For many of you who are, have been Christians for far longer than I have, how many times you have returned to the water's edge, so to speak, heard this story told again. And yet, if you're like me, it seems like with every new visit, there's still something new and meaningful to be gained from it. And I hope that that's the case for you this morning as we read this story together. We won't read the whole thing, but most of what we're going to do this morning is simply read the story that has changed so many of us. This is the story of the cross. Matthew chapter 26. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot amongst the people. Skipping down, then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and he said, what would you give me? If I betray him over to you, and they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment on, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. When it was evening, Jesus took his place amongst the twelve. And while they were eating together, Jesus took a loaf and it took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. You know the story three times. Jesus went off alone and prayed, Father, if it's... Your will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Well, Jesus returned from there to his disciples. Apparently, in the meantime, one of them had slipped away. Now he returned. Verse 39, Judas came to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they came and laid their hands on Jesus to arrest him. And those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had just gathered, and he and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none. At last, two came forward and they said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it again in three days. And the high priest stood up and he said, have you no answer? But Jesus said nothing. Then Caiaphas said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah. And Jesus said, you've said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then Caiaphas tore his clothes and said, he is blasphemed. Do we need any more witnesses? And turning to the crowds, he asked, what is your verdict? And the crowd said, he deserves death. When morning came, they bound him. They led him away. And they handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Now when Judas, his betrayer, saw what Jesus, that Jesus was condemned, he repented. And he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, and he said, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, it's not lawful for us to put them into the treasury since they're blood money. And after conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. 
For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. And Jesus stood before Pilate. Pilate asked the crowds, Whom do you want me to release to you? There was a tradition of releasing one prisoner that time of year. Who do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the Messiah? And all of them said Barabbas. Pilate said, well, what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? And all of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why? What evil has this man done? But they shouted all the more. Let him be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus, stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some crowns or some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they led him away to crucify him. Those who passed by him derided him, shaking their heads. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land till three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he cried out again and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And when the centurion and those with him saw all of this, as they were keeping watch over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and they said, Truly this man was God's son. When it was evening, there came a man from Arimathea named Joseph. He went to Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Joseph took that body, and he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his own new tomb. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb, and he went away. The next day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember what this imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I'll rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. That way, his disciples don't come along and steal away his body and tell the people he must have been raised from the dead. That last deception would be worse than the first. So they went with the guard. And they made the tomb secure by sealing it with a stone, by sealing the stone. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and set on it, for fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. So the women left the tomb. They saw the place where he lay, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. While they were going, some of the guard went to the city, and they told the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised the plan to give those guards a large sum of money telling them, you must say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. So they took the money, just as they were directed, and that story is still told among the Jews to this day. I wonder as we read this story again together, what is it, what new light do we see in it? What has... God brought to the surface for us to consider with each other this morning. As I think about this story, reading it this week as I did, 
I'm struck by the way that so much of this story, I had not remembered how much of this story happens behind closed doors. At least four times in this story, we see moments where Matthew sort of pulls back the curtain of secrecy on what the religious authorities have been doing, plotting amongst themselves together behind closed doors, and then stepping out from there into their roles of authority and power and defending the law against a blasphemer, while all the while plotting murder and planting false testimony into the courts. There's that moment in the story where they get the money from Judas and they say, it's not lawful for us to put this into the treasury, but we can use it to kill the Lord. It's amazing to me that the deception behind closed doors in this story. But not just that, the, the deception that can happen in one's heart. It's possible, like these that we see here, to break every law of God in the name of keeping the law of God. It's possible to think you're doing what's right or what's best, but to to miss it so much it makes me wonder about my own heart and, and what I might find there behind closed doors. Meanwhile, though, as the authorities behave so shamefully behind closed doors, in this story, God is stepping out into the wide open and he is carrying shame itself on his shoulders for you and me so that he might heal us. I can't help but notice that in this story, for every whispered moment behind closed doors, there's another moment where God is throwing the doors wide open. He's tearing the curtain of the temple in two as a symbol that his presence is unleashed upon the world. He's rolling back the stone from the tomb just as death itself is pushed aside by the gift of Christ. As other people whisper shameful things in secret, God is throwing the doors wide open to his house, to his kingdom, and he is whispering, tell the world. Out in the open, he carries our shame so that by his wounds we might be healed. Last week I mentioned this quote from Henry Nowen talking about the wounds of Jesus, and he says that those wounds are like the Grand Canyon, a deep incision on the surface, which has become an inexhaustible source of beauty and understanding. I think the thing that amazes me most and always does about this story is the way that a story that is so grim as this one could ever be called beautiful. And yet, throughout history, so many, and so many of you, can say that is exactly what this is. You know, I mentioned the artist Claude Monet at the beginning of sermon this morning. Monet, who spent the last 30 years of his life painting those water lilies in the small pond near his home in northern France. So many people throughout the years have seen those great paintings and, and just marveled at the, at the work that he was able to do with them. There are a couple of things that most people probably don't know about those paintings. The first is that those paintings were given by Claude Monet as a gift to the nation of France on the day after Armistice Day, the day after World War I had ended and all those peace treaties had been signed. Monet took those paintings that he'd been working on decades before there was a war, and he gave them to his country as a symbol of peace shared amongst people. Second thing you might not know is the reason that Monet chose to paint those water lilies at all. What made him start? What made him pick up that?
paintbrush and go out to the water's edge. As it so happened, he began those paintings in sorrow. So he was mourning the loss of his son. And it was the death of his son that pushed him out into nature. And that's where he fell in love with these water lilies. And so out of these moments of personal and deep sorrow and grief, mourning the loss of his own son, he brought forth this work of beauty that stood for the world as a, as a symbol of peace. So it is, and even more so, with God our Father, the artist, who took not a nameless pond, but a hill outside Jerusalem as his subject. And from that deep anguish and sorrow at his own son's untimely death, God has brought forth a symbol of everlasting life and peace for the world. As Colossians said, he was making peace by the blood of the cross. And every time that we have the chance to return to these scenes together, we may see our own reflection in them like so many shades and colors glancing across the surface of a small, nameless pond. When we read this story together, we may read it as those who are reached by it and touched by it, that it was for you. We may see the doors flung wide open and hear him whisper, come, come. See the place where he lay. See the way that the linen cloths have been folded neatly there. See the way that the tomb and the, and, the, and the stone at the heart of the tomb has been pushed aside for you. Beauty out of anguish. Dignity because of his shame. Life from his final breath healing by his wounds. We always offer an invitation when we're together, and mine is simple this morning. It's simply an invitation to to fall in love with God. Again, perhaps. Maybe if your love for God has grown weak, maybe this is the time for you to return to these scenes again as we have this morning. Return to the cross. My prayer is that you'll have eyes to see the beauty in this anguished story. See the way that it brings peace, even by the blood of a cross. Maybe this morning the invitation is for you because you know that in your heart maybe there's a guilt that you carry the shame that you carry behind closed doors and you don't let anybody see it, well, you ought to know that Jesus carried all of our shame out into the light so that we might be changed and we might be able to be free from it, that we might be healed. Maybe there's someone here today who's ready to surrender your life to Christ you never have before, maybe. We offer that opportunity today as well to be baptized in his name, to experience his mercy and grace, to follow him wherever he goes. Whatever it may be for you, we praise God today as we do every day with all that we are because he made peace at the cross for us. And so we lift our voices to him and we thank him right now while together we stand and while we sing.